But um, I can't introduce Chelsea without saying something about Jacob. Um, you know, it was uh, seven years ago. I uh, Jacob changed my life. Um, just opened my eyes and my world in a new way to persons with disabilities. He's been working at the Independent uh, Resource Learning Center, in, in, Independent Living Resource Center. Um, and uh, he came to a book signing that I had, and um, <laughs> then he just started coming on Sundays and we started, uh, you know, having conversations and, uh, you know, it's just been a beautiful thing. Um, and he's connected me not only with, uh, you know, some people locally, but people in different places. Uh, I mean, my world has been truly rocked by the associations um, that, I mean, next month, I guess I'm going to Sacramento uh, to be a part of a, a demonstration uh, with hand in hand. I uh, won't get into that right now, but all of this is, you know, Jacob triggering all of this and uh, it's, it's just been great. And if it weren't for Jacob, I wouldn't know Chelsea. And uh, just two months ago, something big happened in Chelsea's life. She took Jacob's name <laughs> and uh, what a joyful event that was uh, here in our backyard. So in Chelsea's words, uh, Chelsea Lesnar Buxton, she says, I am a wife to the man of my dreams, disabled and proud of it, queer and a survivor of child abuse. I am just trying to live my best and most authentic life. So everybody, can you give Chelsea a hand? And uh, yeah, let her be welcomed among us. <laughs> All right, take it away. Well, thank you. Um, so first, I'm sick. So if I might, hopefully not, but I might have to cough every once in a while. Um, and so before I get started, um, the things that I'm going to talk about today are pretty heavy. Um, so I encourage anyone that needs to, uh, if you need to step away and take care of yourself, um, totally understandable. Uh, I am going to be talking about some pretty, uh, heavy stuff. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about my mental health journey and uh, living with major depression and generalized anxiety um, and what uh, stuff that has brought along in my life. Um, so uh, I was born in Atascadero. Well, yeah, I uh, grew up in Atascadero um with uh, born with low vision and my initially my parents were married until I was about nine and uh, I lived with up until then I lived with my brother and my sister who are both older than me and uh so I well first I don't even, I probably could count on one hand the amount of memories that I have up until about the age of 10. Um, and um, I lived in a household that was very emotionally and verbally um, and even physically abusive. And um my uh my mom was my main abuser however uh my brother was also a big part of that as well um and so i grew up um uh, not really i mean i don't really even remember most of my childhood and then 
I, even after my parents separated and we moved, I remember having like a little bit of, like I, I have a few years where I have some memories um and in that time frame like I had a decent relationship with my dad uh I mean not perfect but what relationship is um and then uh I can remember I think it's if I remember correctly I think it's about 12 or 13 when uh a child can legally discern whether or not they want to see a parent or not uh when they have when the parents have separated and I remember like I didn't realize it back then but looking back at it uh my mom and my brother would just start trash talking my dad and to the point where I believed them and I remember, um, yeah, I mean, we had our issues, but I I don't think had they not trash talked him, I don't think things would have been nearly as bad. Um, so like fast forward to when I got into high school, I, and this whole time, um because of my low vision um I was very uh I was kind of outcast at school because I couldn't keep up um and and then I um I had some friends but then when I got to high school they all decided that they didn't want to be my friend anymore um so naturally um I also I started getting really depressed and <coughs> excuse me um and so then when I started when I also was going through all this stuff with my dad um not I mean now I know it was a lot of my mom's manipulation but um I thought there was so many things wrong with uh things and she was like manipulating me to think that things were way worse than they were um and so needless to say I got very like suicidal in high school um to the point where had I I didn't want to like I didn't want to die but yet I wanted being the end and I but yet I was still at that stage in my life where I didn't think I needed help and or I didn't deserve to get help uh, because I growing up I whenever I would get sick uh, my mom wouldn't take me to the doctors until I was almost to the point of needing to go to the hospital because I was so sick. Um, and um, and then, you know, the constant, like, if you don't, if you don't reckon, like, if you don't talk about it, the depression meaning, uh, like, if you don't talk about the depression or anything, uh, that could be going wrong, then it must not exist. Um, that's the way it was treated in my household. And I can remember, you know, not being able to get out of bed sometimes and in high school, I, uh, you know, not being able to get out of bed, not like my grades were slipping because I was too depressed to do any of my homework. Um, and, um, the constant, like, shaming from my mom of, well, you still have responsibilities, you still need to, you just need to suck it up, um, and, and then even back when I was younger, and, um, my brother was physically abusing me, 
he would do it right in front of my mom and she wouldn't say a thing. Um, and my brother thought it was funny. Um, and so, and then, uh, so when I was in high school, um, sorry, I'm kind of going back and forth a little bit. Um, but when I was in high school, um, I remember my mom, like, I would be in bed and my mom would just like rip the covers off of me and be like, get up, like, and like shoving me, like, you need to get up. Um, and, oops, sorry. Um, and so I remember like feeling like there's no safe space to be, feel what I'm feeling. And so I learned that just like not saying anything um, was the best like survival uh, coping skill. And I remember I, I would, um, I would like not be allowed to have an opinion. And I can remember like kids at school being like, why don't, asking me like, why don't you ever have an opinion? And at the time I didn't know how to answer that, but now I know that it was because I was never allowed to have an opinion at home. And if I did, then there was a whole lot of, uh, excuse my language, but there was a whole lot of shit for it. Um, and so, and then, so basically fast forward high school, super suicidal. Um, I ended up going to a therapist, but it didn't help. And I was still in that stage of like, I don't need help. I'm fine. I can fix it myself. Um, and then, uh, I went, I went to community college uh mental health got a little better um because I was in a different uh, environment I was still living at home but but it's different school environment <clears throat> and then uh, I mean my my depression was kind of ebb and flow um but I didn't get suicidal again until uh once I went to a uh, university um, and uh, during this time, like over the years, like my vision got worse and worse. And then, but it was pretty, I mean, it was fairly, it would like, my vision would dip a little bit and then it would be stable for quite a while and then it would dip again. Um, and then, so, um, so then when I did go to, got out of community college, um, oh, and sorry, I'm going back a little bit. Uh, my, when I got out of high school, uh, because of all the manipulation and, uh, whatever you want to call it um I ended up stopped talking to my dad and um so I actually so I stopped talking to my dad and then I can remember when I did go to a university uh, I went to CSUMB which is in Monterey and um I was already pretty depressed as it was when I got there. And then uh, my grandpa, who um, was more like a father figure to me than a grandpa, uh, suddenly passed away. And um, I remember my mom only letting me come home for a few days. And then, and then she made me go back to school 
and I um and then three weeks later on my spring break my grandma passed away um and hers her death wasn't as hard only because she had Alzheimer's and I was able I had already grieved for her um a long time ago and so um but um I remember like telling my mom because they were both being cremated uh that I wanted to be there when they got put in the crypt and um and I remember uh my mom making me go back to school uh before um or like right after spring break which would have only been a few days after my grandma passed away um and then when I uh she told me when they were going to be put in the crypt I again asked to be there nope wouldn't come get me um and so um needless to say I got oh and then I also um had uh because uh earlier that year I had come out as a lesbian um and uh I had right be yeah right before my grandma passed away no it was right before my grandpa passed away um I had broken up with my first girlfriend and so all of those three things combined I was super, super depressed. And then uh, my mom, on top of it, because my grades were slipping, told me um, that, um, oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. Um, my mom told me how disappointed in me she was. Um, and so needless to say, uh, later, that year um oh and my uh one of my uncles also passed away um and so needless to say I was suicidal again attempted suicide um and didn't tell anybody for like a week ended up in the hospital for six days and the only reason they would tell uh, release me was if I, uh, if I went into an outpatient program, and um, my I remember my the psychiatrist in the hospital like I remember telling her like I don't want to go back to school, and I kept telling my mom this like, huh, and she was gonna make me go back. And finally, the psychiatrist was able to convince her to let me come home. Um, but, uh, and then I remember, I think it was about six months later, I attempted again. Um, and for whatever reason, I mean, obviously, uh some I feel like something tried to intervene because um in the middle of like my attempt I called my mom and who took me to my to the hospital again ended up in a uh well I was in the hospital for a few days and then ended up in a residential care facility for uh I think it was two weeks and <coughs> And uh, this whole time, my mom is shaming me for the um, and um, and then uh, I mean, there's so much more. I okay, I do have a few moments. Okay, um, and so then. Uh, I got a lot better, um, especially with the outpatient program. Um, took me, you know, a long time, but um, and then about two years ago, uh, I had to call CPS on my brother 
uh, because he was abusing his uh, son, who was three at the time, uh, and so was his mom. Um, and so uh, my brother uh, has violent tendencies, and he was still living at home uh, with my mom and I. And uh, I remember the night that uh, he found out uh, that I was the one that called. And I remember him like uh, pounding on my door, like telling me to come open the door, he's gonna kick it in. And um, and so I um so I left um for my own safety and needless to say my mom and pretty much everyone on my mom's side of the family all take my brother's side so I've been uh the outcast for of that side of the family for the last two years um and um uh, uh moved around I think four times in a year and a half. Um, and um, and then I uh, actually met Jacob right before um, that, all that fun, not really fun stuff uh, went down. And so um, he was a super big rock, um, the only, the only thing that I recognized of my life after that happened. Um, and uh, I can definitely thank him for uh, helping me through a lot of the emotional um, stuff that's uh, been ingrained in, my, in me for so long. And um yeah so and then um I moved to Santa Barbara uh, back in October and uh even though I I've been moving so much the last two years uh honestly they were the best uh these have been the best two years of my life and I you know, I think it's interesting, uh, right, like, probably about a year or so before I left my mom's, I was starting to get all these, like, uh, health issues, I was having migraines pretty much every day, uh, I had high blood pressure, I, and then I developed, like, the stomach issue where I couldn't even eat really. Um, and right after, I, as soon as I left, uh, within a month um, of leaving, all my health issues disappeared. Um, and, um, and so, but yeah, I just, um, it's just been a very interesting journey. Um, I mean, you know, recovery is not um, a linear thing. It's definitely a lifelong journey. And um, I um, just think my lucky stars that I found Jacob and I, yeah, I mean, I'm just really thankful. Um, and then, yeah, I thank you so much for letting me share. Um, I, this is my first time like publicly sharing my story. So uh, I really appreciate it. I've been uh, wanting to get into the mental health world um, and I'm starting to get there, but um, I've been really wanting to find spaces where I can share my story. So I appreciate everyone listening. Um, and that's all I have.
Yes, let's all give Chelsea hand. Thank you, Chelsea. You are beautiful. Chelsea, David asked me if I would lead our discussion. Um, okay. two, things, two things I wanna say to start. The first is that um, it has been really wonderful to get to know you a little better in this time. Um, just because of the nature of everything, you know, we, we, we pass each other and we, we see these little pictures on the screen, but, but mm. um, it's really wonderful to get to know you a bit. And then yeah. the more, well, and the, the other really important thing is I want to thank you for trusting us. Um, I can't imagine how scary it was to share your story um, for the first time with a bunch of folks, some of whom are really strangers. <laughs> but, but to open your heart and your life like that, um, thank you. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, it's almost easier sharing it with people that don't know me very well. Um, and, you know, it's... <laughs> Um, yeah. and shoot, I was going to say something else. Uh, sorry, my brain's a little foggy today. <laughs> well, it's, you've, you've done a lot and, and just to open that like this is, is really something. There were a couple of pieces that really jumped out at me mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how to frame them in, in terms of questions, uh, for, for you to address or for anybody else to, to address, but I think there are things to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. The first was when you, you talked about feeling like there was no safe space. And my perception of the beloved community is that we are a safe space. Yeah. Um, but the, the question that I wrestle with is how do we make that space available for folk who feel like there is no safe space and how do we communicate that? Do you have any thoughts? Um, well, the only thing that I can, that really comes up to me um, is I know there's, um, uh, what's it? Um, I know like now this would be better if we had an actual physical space, but I know there's like um stickers um that you can put in your windows that um I forget I'd have to look it up. I forget um exactly what it says, but it's basically like a um like this is a safe space. Mm -hmm. And then also like being for me at least being a part of the uh lgbtq community yeah. um which i also forgot to mention is that um once i met jacob i realized i was actually bisexual uh -huh. um, um uh, <laughs> and um but i know like for me uh seeing like any rainbow stuff like that's like uh just even just seeing that is like okay this is maybe a safe space okay okay i you know my my story when i was a 13 year old there was an adult man who kind of took me under his wing mm -hmm. and and looking back i realized how formative that was for me to 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 have someone who wasn't part of my family who accepted me exactly as i was and didn't mm -hmm. have to do that you yeah know, I, now I older, I, I realize lots of families don't do it either, <laughs> but <laughs> but especially that that here was a person who didn't have to, and and how we can how we can live that out is is something I wrestle with. Yeah. The other piece that you you said that I really was struck by when you said recovery is not a linear thing. Yeah. That yeah. you know even even those of us. When we're when we're in our most healthy places, um, we still have those experiences that kind of push us somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, you know, the same question comes back. How can we be a community that is there for folk to act as a safe landing spot when they they experience those those difficult moments? Um, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is um like um and for me, I was always the person that like um I never showed um how depressed I was actually and I I mean I tried my best not to show it um and so and nobody ever asked me like how are you like how are you really mm. uh, and so my encouragement is and to even like sit down with um and it doesn't not well it doesn't have to be a sit down but like just um make sure that you're asking even the people that may not even seem like they have any issues um how are you like and if they say okay um say especially if you notice um a decline in their mental health or like if you notice something's off about them um like even just mentioning like hey like I see this are you really okay okay thank you I see Lisa has her hand up Lisa well I just want to commend you Chelsea on your bravery it's a fearless thing that you've done in so many things throughout your life, hearing your story. I, um, so I'm grateful that you've um, shared it with us. That's brave too. I, I wanted to um, see, I wanted to touch on something that it seems like you had to deal with that you were actually the healthy person and you were surrounded in your family by the unhealthy, the mentally unhealthy where you were the mentally healthy one, and yet you were the one who was treated like you had something wrong with you. And I think if we look into mental illness, that we find that the people who are actually the mentally ill ones are the people who have placed others and claimed that. And I, you just reiterated that for me. I saw this as an example with another friend recently where this person was the kind one. This person only wanted to help others and they were treated badly and they were told you have issues you need therapy when in fact and that wasn't the case she was the healthy one and the others around her were healthy for the ones who were unhealthy needing help so i just i just wanted to point that out and have you share a bit yeah because you were the one who stood up for the child because you were the one with integrity and you were the one who was brave enough to say, you know what, uh, this is wrong. And the rest of your family, you backed the, the tormentor. And so again, you're very brave. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, Roy. I wanted to make a comment, attorney. Um, I think all of us felt what you said, Chelsea, very, very powerful. And when you did say, I don't want to die, but I want my pain to stop or to end, it's hard not to feel that, mm. very hard not to feel that. I think most of us start off feeling we have a safe place and um, can have that from our homes. All of us didn't, but I did. And I think when I didn't, I didn't know it. Maybe I was so young, but it feels like also that your story is the same as the PTSD. When it the things come back, it's yeah. hard to, yeah, it's very hard to keep it from coming. But when it comes, wow, it's, oh, yeah. and so you didn't through a lot of your life you didn't feel seen, you no. didn't feel heard. 
And now recently in your life, the feeling of being seen and being heard is so very, very healthy to you. And all of our healing is definitely a process. And your suggestion about, you know, maybe if there is a way people can let people know what they're feeling, because we get very good at masking our yeah. inner pains. <laughs> oh, yes. And so I really like the idea that sometimes there is a sticker or something or, you know, something out there that can help us reach out in a way that we don't know. And your being able to speak to us today, you know, we're all learning that everybody has a story. All stories aren't gloom or unfortunate. Some stories are great, but they're all helpful stories because they're our stories. Yes. So I appreciate the power in your sharing. And I just love when people can connect to us because it makes our love more powerful because that's what we all want to do. We want to reach out and love anyone mm -hmm. and even love their stories because they're helpful to us. So I thank you so much for sharing your story. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Someone else? I was going to piggyback on Ernie's comment um, with something from uh, Father Greg with Homeboy Industries. He talks about the people that he works with there, how they've been watched but never seen, that whole idea. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted to add to that. And that's so true. So true. Um, Chelsea, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story. It's it's relatable. <laughs> it's relatable. Mm -hmm. And so many people that it takes so long to uh, to just be able to say, you know, what what you're going through, what you've been through. And uh, I, I just appreciated it. But you said something about not having memories. And. I wonder if you, like myself, if you feel like the not having memories was maybe a uh, a way that God protected you. Oh, absolutely. Mm hmm. And because uh, I, I I honestly have to look back and see that that probably was protection. Um, and the other thing you said was there there are ebbs and flows in your depression. And that you were also in a uh, a crisis residential, oh no, a residential facility. Yes. I, okay. I all I work in a crisis residential facility, and oh, okay. And I was wondering, Chelsea, when you're in your depressed, you know, your depression, when and mm -hmm. and it, it's tough. So I'm wondering the the words that are said to you or that you hear or. Or maybe what works best for you or that you would say work best? Uh, mm. um, see, it's so hard because I, when I was in the residential facility, um, I even though like I know like looking back I obviously know that they were trying to help um I was uh I recognized that I was projecting on my like um what I was used to which was nobody's listening to me nobody hears me um and but I remember the one thing that really even sticks to me so much today and now I mean that was what like three years ago um is one of the counselors when I was leaving told me um uh based to the, something to effective 
Um, I hope I never see you again because that means you're doing well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. I, it, it's so important to listen to stories. I know just walking up and like you said, you said when they say, yeah, I'm okay, I'm fine. It's, it's usually not the case. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Chelsea. You're welcome. Thank you. I do want to thank you profusely, Chelsea. I think you're a beautiful, beautiful person. And uh, your heart is completely, you know, in the right place. And it was very brave of you to, to share. But I'm, I'm so happy in my heart for you that you uh, feel safe you know, enough to share with us. Um, I uh, want to say that you are strong, you know, yeah. and um, so, so blessed. And, and all of, all of your beauty just is, is just like, it's just radiating out, you know, and, and it's your relationship with the Holy Spirit in you, hun, that that I'm 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 feeling, you know, um, coming through even as you know uh, we're in the little squares, like somebody else had said, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's that's what's coming through, and I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for your sincerity, you know, yes. for um, all the work that you have done. Um, I recently told my oldest son, uh, mm. you know, son, you really should get into therapy. You know, I, I'm a strong believer that everyone needs therapy, need, you mm -hmm. know, and what you shared is legitimate because it happened to you. They're your experiences and, and, the beauty that you can help others through your sharing beautiful i want to thank you from the core of my heart i send you a big hug oh thank you thank you so much god bless you thank you i was going to tell you chelsea, chelsea go ahead and start getting ready girl just get <laughs> ready today was the first but there's gonna be many more get ready I girl so. i hope so you know there's gonna be many more shares and many more you know yeah people that you're gonna be speaking to about your experience and in, in your your story so Thank you go girl you get Thank ready you. for it you know this was, this was your this was all in preparation for it but you know yeah know that. thank you i'm glad to see that i'm glad to see you're here well you know? thank you yes me too <laughs> yes <laughs> god bless you thank you Well, uh, thank you all for participating, even uh, if just being present and listening is, uh, is your participation. And as Roy mentioned, you know, we, we want to be a safe space. We don't want to be a judgmental space. We don't want to tell people how they should live, you know, we want to encourage one another to uh, to find their path and to to stay on their path, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep encouraging one another. And now Kanichi is going to uh, lead us in. We we say communion. Um, I think I'm going to say he's going to lead us in community. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, um, Chelsea, um, just with everyone, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, my wife and I say thank you for sharing your story, for allowing us to hear. Uh, this, is, this is what, you know, uh, the divine realm is about, to hear uh, voices um, on the margins and, and, and otherwise that we don't hear because of the other loud voices that supersedes all the time 
And so it's our privilege to have heard your uh, narrative. And so thank you, we are that much better. And today, um, it's amazing. Uh, Ernie hit it right on the head, uh, on the nail. Um, I was thinking as we were um, going to take communion that Chelsea, uh, your narrative in essence is our narrative. Our narrative is your narrative. And ultimately all narratives are Christ's narrative and that we are all connected um we are connected and that was the theme of of even the um the the the, the communal reading and and the music that we are connected and um, um even last week we are connected and so i can't help but to see uh the breaking of the body of um, um uh, jesus's body and then partaking of his shed blood is the, the um, sign, if you will, or um, indicator that he's saying, you are connected with me, I'm connected with you, and we, human, human race, are connected with one another. So in that spirit, let's, let's take the, um, the, the, the broken body of Christ and let's partake of it together. And then let's partake of the shed blood of Christ together. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> 